Isn't that awesome? Is that awesome? Yeah. Do you know why that was awesome? It wasn't awesome because they come up here and they practice. It wasn't awesome because they, they picked the right music and the right key. It wasn't awesome because we got the right instruments or the right sound system, although I love our speakers. Good call, Pastor Josh. It was awesome because these people came out here and they just responded to God and you felt that. We desperately lack that in our churches today. Amen. And, and, and to be fair, you know, to, 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 to really be fair, I think we desperately lack that in our lives today, right? Just responding to God in all things. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to, to the book of Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. If you have your, your Bibles, you can turn there. And if you don't have them, we'll have it on the screen. And, and I know we don't have any of the pews yet, but the good news is we're actually we're contemplating getting some new pew Bibles. So that'd be kind of cool, right? Woo! Yeah, everybody loves new but Come on, yeah, give it up for Bibles. <laughs> but we're in Revelation 2, beginning in verse 8. And now that you're, you're seated and you're comfortable, again, we you rise to your feet as we read the word of the Lord? I was raised Catholic, so I believe in rise, sit, rise, sit, kneel, sit, stand, right? It's, it's, I think exercise is important in church. It's right, right? This is where we get our steps in. And when you rise, take your phone with you so your steps count. No, that was wrong, pastor. Kind of. The word of the Lord in Revelation 2, beginning in verse 8. Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who, who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. And beware, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So you may be tested. And for ten days you will have affliction. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Okay. Before we understand that and understand what, anything about this, we have to put this in context. And, and we don't have time to like lay it all out there, so I'm going to kind of give you a short, short version of the city of Smyrna. So the city of Smyrna in, in the first century has a, a particular kind of culture, but one that came over the course of hundreds of years bringing them to where they are. You see, this city especially, this, this city has a very long-standing loyalty to Rome, to the Republic, to the Empire. And, and it went back a, a couple hundred years, actually went back almost 300 years, when Rome was in this struggle with, with its power, trying to keep, keep itself together. And it was, it, it was in, this, in, this, in this couple hundred year war uh, with the Carthaginian Empire, what we call, if you remember your history classes, the Punic Wars, right? So Rome is in the middle of these Punic Wars, and, and, and it's not looking good for Rome. It looks like Rome may lose everything that they've worked so hard to put together. But in, in the very beginning of this war, in the very beginning, uh, all the way back to the, the third century BC, before Jesus, this community of Smyrna, this city, they said, we, we here in Smyrna, we are choosing a side. And there are many who haven't who said, well, we're going to wait to see how it settles and decide what's going on. Or, or we're going to join the, 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 Carthaginians, the Carthaginians because it looks like they're winning. But Smyrna said, no, we are Roman. And we will stand with the Roman Empire. And we have faith in the Roman Empire. So very early on, they took their stand and they said, we stand with Rome. Now, this became very important to who they are. In fact, right in the middle of this war, in the middle of this couple hundred war, they wanted to make sure people knew that this city stood with Rome. So much so that they actually built, at this time, a temple to the goddess Roma. 
They said, you know what? We're in the middle of a battle where people are afraid Rome is going to lose. Let me show you how much we believe in Rome and how much we're going to stand before Rome. We are going to build a temple to the goddess Rome, or the patron goddess of Rome, right here, right now. And we're going to let the world see who it is that we support. And so in 195 BC, they built, they built this temple to this goddess. And it worked out. Rome won. But this city had always remembered and always remembered as the city that was truly loyal. They were truly, they were truly Romans. They loved their nation, their empire, and they would put anything into it. And they proved that because even when the going was tough, they stood up and said, we are Romans. And this was a very important part of what this community is. In this community, during the time when John wrote this, during the time when Jesus gave this revelation to John, during that time in Smyrna, they had a very thriving imperial cult. Now you may not know what an imperial cult is, so let me me share this with you. An imperial cult is basically just, it's a form of a state religion in which the emperor or the the, the dynasty of emperors are worshipped as demigods or deities. So here they had, we worship Rome. Rome is a part of our, of our religious system. In fact, in Rome during this time, in fact, from the time that Julius Caesar was killed, when a Caesar would die, they were declared by the state, by Rome, to become uh, a, a god. They were divious. They were divine. And their predecessor, who was always their adopted son, would then take on the title of Huios Deos, the son of God. And when they die, they too would become divine. And so there's always this, this belief, this understanding that in Rome, the leadership was either deified or moving in that direction towards becoming a god. So if you were to be Roman, part of being Roman meant recognizing that your, your emperor is the son of God. And you need, no matter what else you choose to worship or whatever you do, you must, you must show allegiance to that god, to this imperial cult. So you're allowed to have whatever religion you want, but you must also participate in the imperial cult. And if you did not participate, if you did not have a certificate that showed that you participated in this imperial cult, they could imprison you. They could execute you. And so here's here's Smyrna, and they're very proud of this, that this is who they are. We we engage in the imperial cult in, in, in this better than anybody else. We love our nation. We love what we do. And they were so much into this, then they even became designated as a neocadas, which is to say that they were the gatekeepers for the Roman gods. Like this city is like the up there. We are Roman city. It is our culture and who we are. Now, Try to imagine being a Jew in this community. Because as a Jew, you had already stuck out because you're monotheistic. I believe in one God, one God only. The Jews would recite the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? We worship one God and one alone. So how would you get around this? How would you circumvent this this need, this law? How do I reconcile the requirements of the worship, of my worship, and this imperial cult? Or even a better idea became, how do I circumvent the imperial cult without making enemies of the the community? And so what the Jews had, fortunately for them, was they had a legal exemption. And this went all the way back to Julius Caesar, who provided it for them. And then Augustus, who who came and made it a law. That they, they fell under what was known as the religio licitum. Which is to say that Jews were a small group of people who had a written exemption from participating in the imperial cult. They didn't have to. They didn't have to do this thing. So we're allowed. It worked out for them, right? That's a wonderful thing for them. But here's what happened to them all the same. Just because I'm in a community and I'm not legally obligated to engage in those things that the community does, I have to also recognize that that community affects me. That community has the resources for me. It's going to decide whether people buy my products or whether I can, I can have a job in this community. They're going to affect whether we're going to be able to have a synagogue here because there are so many other ways that they can attack us if they don't like the fact that we don't engage in what they believe in just because we have a legal exemption. So the Jews there wanted to play ball with the community and recognize the importance of this, especially if they wanted to survive. They weren't necessarily participating in this imperial cult. 
But if they didn't do something to show that they were a part of what was happening there, if they didn't make compromises, it meant that they would see a decline in support because the community is important to the local congregation. This is true in any aspect, in any church, right? Our community is important to what happens in our local congregation. You guys have jobs out here in our community. Our children go to school out here in our community. We're, we're even under laws, building laws and whatnot of our community. And so the synagogues ended up coming to a point where they prioritized pleasing the people over worshiping God. Except for one sect of Jews. This Christian church. And this Christian sect of Jews in, in Smyrna in, in the Christian church, when we read that, you need to understand it's really nothing more than just Jews who worship Jesus as the Messiah. So these, these Jews, they refused to play ball with the community. They refused to do this. They said, you know what? We get that we have the legal exemption, and that's awesome. But we're also not going to engage in those things. We're not going to make compromises. We're not going to bring the eagle into the, in, into the sanctuary for Rome. We're not going to do that because this is God's house. We'll respect the laws. We'll keep the peace as much as we can. But we are not going to make exemptions. We're going to be very different from what the community or the people say they demand. Amen. But because of that, and this is why he talks about this, they suffered. He said, you are poor. They suffered financially. They took a financial hit from this. They, they suffered illegally because they found all kinds of reasons to get them. And their businesses would be boycotted. Many were arrested, imprisoned. Many were even killed for refusing to participate in the imperial cult. In fact, that's what it means when he says you're there for 10 days. Because you're held for 10 days before you're executed. Like he's saying, you're going to, to be executed for doing this. See, the socioeconomic power had likely caused many of the Jews to betray the church. To betray especially this sect of Judaism. Because this sect of Judaism, these, these who claim that Jesus was their Messiah, they were stirring up the pot so these other Jews who had the synagogues would say, well, let me explain something, because I don't want you guys to be mad at them and assume that we're like them. They worship this guy, Jesus. We killed him. He's not one of us. In fact, they're not even Jews. They're, they're, not, they're not. They like Gentiles in there. They're not Jews. And as such, you also probably know that this order that we have that makes us exempt is for us as Jews. And since we're telling you they're not Jews, they're no longer exempt. And so the Christians were more open to now being persecuted very publicly. And so they started to betray their fellow Jews because they worshiped Christ. Now, something to consider, and it's a bit of a side point, that in Smyrna, there are these two sects of Jews. Like, I want you to get this. There were the Jews who believed that Jesus was Messiah, what we call Christians, and the Jews who didn't believe Jesus was Messiah. They're the two types of Jews we see here. And the non-Jesus worshiping Jews slandered the Jesus worshiping Jews. In the same way that, that, that vicious businesses would do to each other to protect themselves or to get more business from others. To protect their own assets, if you will. And of these non-Jesus worshiping Jews, so these are the ones... These non-worshipping Jews who slandered the Jesus-worshipping Jews. Jesus says, I know the slander on the part of those who say they're Jews. But let me tell you, they're not. They're not Jews. In fact, they're a synagogue of Satan. Because they refuse to worship Christ and they betray their brothers who do. Now, as for the Jesus-worshipping Jews in Smyrna, or as, as, as we call them today, Christians. Or as this letter calls them, the church in Smyrna. They refused to play this game of pleasing the people at the expense of the teaching of God. And by refusing to engage in this, by, by the way they, they, they lived their lives, they did end up stirring up a hornet's nest around them. They stirred up trouble. And their personal businesses suffered. And they were killed. They, they were persecuted for refusing to play ball and compromise with the desires of the people. Friends, the, the spirit that threatened the church in Smyrna is a spirit of self-serving consumerism. Amen. That is, it's a spirit of trying to serve the desires of the individual at the expense of the gospel because, well, the individuals are the people with the resources and the power to affect us both in the church and in the community. And since they have the power to affect what happens in here or out there, 
They shifted everything inside to please them. And this spirit is seen in various forms even today. Now, let me tell you, let me give you an example. I'm, I'm going to pick on a generation, forgive me, but, but it's, it's, it's just kind of a, a very clear example for us today. In the 1940s, the population began to explode. Right? We received a new generation, a generation unlike we've never had any generation of this size before, right? The baby boomers are this huge conglomerate generation. And when this new population began to explode, the commerce in America was forced to adjust to reach all these new people who were resources, who had power, who were sources of what we want. And, and it's even here, if you go back and you look back kind of in history, it's here that we start to see more of the brick and mortar businesses become established. We start to see more of these things that are selling products for the people, you know, whatever you want, all kinds of different things. But we also start to see businesses offering something that wasn't really offered as much before, and that's customer service, right? That, that's when customer service became a real thing. That's the feeling that, you know what? We have not only what you want. Go back and look at your ads in the 50s and 60s, right? And it really is more along the, we have this thing that you want, and we're here to make you happy, and we're going to please you, and we're going to make you happy. And it became all about the customer. And only, only the businesses that were individually customer-oriented, saying, you're the customer, the customer's always right, and we're going to give you exactly what you want. If not, we're going to make every effort to fix it and do it right. Only those businesses survived and succeeded in this new economic market. That's a reality in America. That's where we saw this shift. And people, when this happened, people soon realized that they liked being treated as if their personal needs were all that mattered. We love that. We love that personal touch. Even now we complain, right, because of the whole, the whole way the world is all internet wild. We're like, I miss customer service. And I do. I miss customer service, especially when I call customer support, right? That's not customer service. Customer support, customer service, very different things. Have nothing to do with each other, right? But we miss service because I like the feeling that I matter to you. I know that you have all this, but it makes a big deal to me when you say, let me stop everything I'm doing and fix your problem. And let me get this right for you. We like that. That's why this work. But here's the thing that we need to understand. And this is a reality. So please don't take it wrong because what happened to any group of people if this happened to them. The spirit of consumerism that, that came into, into our nation, into this world, bled into the churches as well. Because church leaders quickly realized that if they wanted to attract congregants, they needed to provide for them the same type of individualistic service and customized service that the businesses were offering them. After all, everybody's already been conditioned to be fighting for their time. Amen. And so they started to do this. And this form of this spirit of consumerism started to overtake the church as a whole. And without realizing it, this entire generation was conditioned to believe that the local church, like any good business, should satisfy their specific needs and concerns. Amen. And in response to that, the gospel started to suffer. Yes. Let, me, let me show you an example of this. Because now that the gospel becomes this marketable item, we see all these things coming up in the market. We see things like mashed potatoes. Remember, what, what, mashed potatoes don't come in a box, do they? But they used to. This is when they came out. Instant mashed potatoes. You just add some water in there, bam, you got mashed potatoes. Diane's cringing back there. Because Diane would probably never even allow this in her house if I know Diane. Like, get that out of the house. You can bring drugs in here, but you're not bringing those. <laughs> right? I'm exaggerating, obviously. I right? don't, don't think that that's kind of a household. Okay, I'm going to stop picking on Diana. Sometimes when you dig a hole, stop digging. Okay. But my point is this. So this happens. But look what we did to the gospel also. Just like instant mashed potatoes became a hit, this entire gospel was reduced to an easy packaged message that could be written on a card that we call a tract. We get so excited about tracts and boiled down to ABCs. Like, I can take three letters. And we get so proud of ourselves as a church. Yes, what took God 66 books to write, we managed to streamline into three letters. You're welcome, God. I mean, it's cool. Y'all got and all that. But you don't know marketing. We got it covered. We got your back. And we're so proud of this. But here's the problem with this. This is such a reduction of the gospel 
that these mashed potatoes are more in line with real mashed potatoes than this is with the real gospel. And that's a huge issue. Because listen, they are both extracts of the real thing. Yes, these flakes come from real potatoes, I think. You have to add the milk and, and, and the salt and the butter that comes out of taters, apparently. And it's microwavable. Anything microwavable should just be wrong anyway, right? Toast air fryer, air fryer. Air fryers are proof that God loves you. I'm just saying. But in the same way, yes, this, this is a part of the gospel. It's extracted from the gospel. They're right. But they've narrowed it down so much that it misses the nuances and the flesh and the reality and the good news and the narrative that makes it matter. And so we end up with this entire generation, at least other generations in churches, that are like, come in, all we want to do is get you to say a prayer, get you baptized, move on next, and we got to do it. And we would put up, remember the boards that had on, how many got saved last week? How many got sanctified? And I'm not totally against those, but those are the result of showing how good our marketing is doing. Because that is the culture that we live in. And we even hear language like, Dude, I'm just church shopping. Think about that. You're shopping for a church? And it tells us just how consumer-minded we really are and how much we expect churches to feel our needs. And it is heartbreaking. It should be absolute heartbreaking us for us to consider that so many people are more likely to leave or choose a church because maybe it doesn't have the type of music they like. Well, I like hymns, not contemporary. Or I like contemporary, not hymns. Or, or not come to a church because it doesn't have hours that are convenient for me. I don't, I don't like Sundays. It's my only day off. I get that one a lot. Sundays are my only day off. I can't believe you made me come to church. Yes, Lord forbid that you take a day off to, to thank the God who allowed you to work, but whatever. And then I don't like those hours. Maybe if you have some Saturday service or something, I could come. Or, or I'm not going to come to church because the message that they preach there isn't a message that fits my political preference. Or the political preference of the community. And I don't like the church because I don't like the way it's decorated and it doesn't appeal to me. And, and if they're going to have pews and not chairs, I'm out. Or if they're going to take out the pews and put chairs, I'm out. And every one of these, which we do, you know, struggle with, these are the things that, that feed our consumer mind. But it should be heartbreaking that people are more concerned with these things than they are over the fullness of the gospel message preached in the church. There are not enough people who say, I'm here because, man, that was powerful. The, Lord, the Lord's doing a wonderful thing here. The way, the way they sing, that's, that's praise. Hallelujah. I want to be part of that. So the wedgies we give, we talked this morning, right? Sometimes, someone once told me that my, my sermons could sometimes be wedgies. That they're wedgie sermons. That if you like a wedgie or not, it doesn't matter. But the thing about a wedgie is you can't do anything else until you deal with that thing. <laughs> Which is good, right? So Josh is going to start us a new logo. Wedgie, oh, never mind. We need, yeah, I don't, let's just stop there. <laughs> but but in, in, we've become a people, and I see this so much, it breaks my heart, who are content with saying as long as, as, as the church says that I'm saved in Jesus and the rest of the Bible is really at the bottom of a long list that's important to me. As so long as the church wants to say I'm saved in Jesus, then I don't, I'm not concerned about the rest of the Bible. I mean, it's on a list, but it's at the bottom of other things. And listen, the thing that makes customer service great is that individual care, that, that thing that feeds us, the individual. And the individual is singled out by the commerce is the most important thing. That's why this translates to us, because for us, commerce is the thing. For them, for them, it was really this political stand, but it was the same thing. This is who we are. We have this commercial mind, this this individualistic consumerism, this spirit, this evil spirit that makes the individual and his or her needs or desires the most important priority of the local church. And we give into it as pastors because look, it matters to me. It, it does. First off, at the very least, it discourages pastors. It discourages me when I come in and, and you only have a few people in church. You're like, it, it's hard. It is so hard. I told you guys, I preached a sermon once. I planted a church in Santa Fe. And, and we had evening church there. And um, one day it was Super Bowl Sunday. I drove an hour to Santa Fe with Trina and Sienna. 
And not a single person showed up. And I thought, well, I'm going to go home. And the Lord, the Lord convicted me. He's like, I didn't call you to come here and preach and have a worship service if people came. Amen. So Trina ran slides and she was our one congregant doing this while running the slides at the PowerPoint. I'm not kidding. This is Trina. Sienna, Sienna came up and grabbed a mic. We sang a set of songs. It was weird, huh, Sienna? We were like, wow. And I preached a message. Because it wasn't about consumerism, right? Like, we're here to do this task. And it hurts to not have people there. We want that. So as pastors, it's easy for us to do whatever it is. Well, let's bring people in. Let's make it attractive. Let's do this. Let's make that lighter. Let's do that. We want to make it so that the people are happy so that they'll come. But we can't do this at the point where, where, where Jesus is no longer the most important thing at the church. I mean, I love you guys. But you are not the most important thing here. Jesus is. And that's why we gather. Amen. So I know, well, okay, pastor, well, then what? Are we supposed to make everything boring so we can protect the, the integrity of the gospel message? No. In fact, in fact, I would even argue that intentionally making a church boring is, 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 is the other side of the same, same um, coin of consumerism. You're just choosing a different demographic. I'm just going to lead, try to find these other people who feel this way. Are we supposed to rebel intentionally against everything that people like or desire and say, well, we won't have anything to do with them, nothing like that. We're just going to build a wall and protect ourselves from them? Well, of course not, because that separates us from the world. It prevents us from sharing the gospel. I mean, consider last week's message on the spirit of boundaries, that this, this can happen if we do that. Because, friends, let me tell you something. There really is nothing wrong with being appealing or tending to the needs and desires of others. There isn't. What matters is why we are appealing. Why we are tending to the needs of others. Maybe a better way to say this is, what matters is who has caused us to respond in such a way that it is appealing to the world and the cares and the needs of others. Amen. Amen. I mean, consider worship itself. I, I was reading the Psalms, Psalm 95. It says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And notice what the psalmist saying. He's not saying, he's not saying, okay, well, you have to sing. That's fine. You can sing. There's many ways to do this, to express this. It's not like mute people aren't able to do this. It's ridiculous, right? We, we, we are to do some kind of an expression. But what he wants us to focus on is the emphasis is as a response, an according response to our Savior, God. This God's my Savior. He did this for me. I just want to thank you for this. God saved me. We should respond to that. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. When I sing, it's a noise, but it's joyful. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. And in his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it in the dry land which his hands have formed. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying we, when you consider everything about this God, how indescribable he is, and this requires the fullness of scriptures and the transforming body that is the church, when we would come together and we would try to contemplate all the fullness of this God, then worship becomes nothing more than this response to this awesome, indescribable God, this King above all kings. And when we try to describe it, friends, here's the thing. When we try to describe God, when we try to express it, we're going to fail. We're going to fail. Yeah. But we are compelled as this natural response to try anyway. I fail in singing this morning. I didn't even care if I messed up the singers. Like, I'm going to sing. I looked up and I could see the singers kind of going, oh, goodness. But it don't matter. We were responding. We... Uh, um, th this morning, actually, I was really thinking about this, praying about this, and so I threw this in there. I want, I want you. To... I, I love David Crowder. He's one of my favorite, um, my favorite worship leaders. He really is. I love his music. I think he's a wonderful artist. But but I was thinking of these uh, these um, lyrics in one of his songs, and so I, I just thought, you know, I'm just gonna put them on and I'm gonna read them. I thought about singing them to you, so if I if I kind of start to, you can cringe. I don't mind. But it, but it's from one of my favorite songs, after all. Listen, listen to what he's saying, because this, this is why we worship. I 
and God is good. He says, I can't comprehend your infinitely beautiful and perfect love. Oh, I've dreamed dreams of majesty. It's brilliant. There's a billion stars. It's a lot of light. But they're never bright enough. Because you are holy. And so I will sing a song for you, my God. With everything that I have in me. It's never loud enough. Because you are so holy. This worship team doesn't practice to please you. You need to know that. They don't. They practice so that they can bring each other their gifts and their talents and bring them together and respond more appropriately, more loudly, brighter, more creatively to our God because He is holy. Amen. And let me tell you something. True worship, true worship, it'll be attractive. But not because they're trying to please you, but because their response to God is beautiful. John Wesley once said, I love this. This is, this is, this is I think, it's just where I want to be always. I think it's why I, I sometimes I, I become neurotic. He says, light yourself on fire with passion, and people will come from miles to watch you burn. You want, you want to be attractive? Just get on fire for God. I remember preaching my first Spanish service. It was in Santa Fe. They, um, when I got there, they had no musical instruments at all. They only had their voices, and so they clapped and they sang as a response to their love for God. And I'm thinking, man, this, when they first started, well, this is going to be awkward. Like, just clapping and singing, okay. And it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen because they were just responding to God. When we went to, to Malawi, Africa, and we went to go watch them worship, I was blown away. Because they didn't have instruments, but they danced barefoot on dirt floors with such joy that their love for God was absolutely apparent. It was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And I just, I wanted more of that. The psalmist says, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The, the, the charisma, the beauty, this act of worship as a response to God, it cannot be replicated as a product. It can only be experienced as the response to the gospel. To the full gospel. And what happens then, friends, is when we get filled with this love of God, when we start to understand and we grow in God and we mature and we walk this together, then that love for God is going to cause us to respond to everything that this world throws at us. Listen to me. Everything that this world throws at us in a way that will testify to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is only then when we're filled with this love for God that we can properly participate in providing the needs of our brothers and sisters. Because all of a sudden, we're doing it not because it makes people happy or because that's what they want. It's how we bring people here. But we go there and say, I'm going to feed you because you're hungry. And frankly, if you come to church, I don't care. I just want to tend to you. We need to be a people who, who seek others for the right reason. I shared once when I was in Los Alamos, and the same principle is true here. In Los Alamos, when I got there, there was a church of six people. When I brought my family, I got an award that year for doubling the size of the church. We got 100% growth. <laughs> Woo! All right, went up to 12 people. It's awesome. Just showed up. We even started a children's department. Um, but I remember telling the church, I want you to hear this because the same is true for us. This is how we know, I think, if what we're doing is right. I told them, if we were to put in all the effort, if you worked hard, you, you, you did everything, this small group, you invested everything you are to share the gospel of God into this community, to be Christ in this community. And, and in this community where we lived, in this county, there were 18,500 people. And I told them, and every one of those 18,500 people, because of your hard work, because of your investment, because of your love for them, they came to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Would you rejoice? 
And of course, it's big, yeah, hello. Okay, six people. Yeah, I'm in, right? Because the kids were in the back, so we still only had six, and Trina was back there, so that kind of ended the rest of them. They're excited. Who wouldn't be? Would you be excited if we reached every one of the 41,000 people in, in this community for Christ? Kind of? Okay. So, but imagine this. Imagine you pour everything you are, what little bit of resources we have here, you pile together, you pour everything you are into these people. And every one of them come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. But every single one of the 18,500 people in this community go become a part of a different church and not one of them come here. Are you still as happy? They paused. We should never pause. I don't care. Come on. If we got to fill up Bethel Church, New Canaan Church, let's do it. It's got to be not, not about... Seeking the individual to fill the church, but seeking the individual because we love them. And that's how we, how we battle this spirit of consumerism. And it's only then when we're filled with this love that we can properly participate in providing for these things. No longer participating in some game for the clientele, but just simply serving. Fixing the baseball field, not because we want people to come to church, but because we want to open it up to the community. Repaving the parking lot because the Lord has blessed us with a beautiful parking lot that we want to have there to last and take care of what God's given us. And that realistically, when we do do that, when we become a people who refuse to, to bow down to needs over the gospel, it will put us at odds with the spiritual forces of evil in this world. You will suffer persecution from other Christians who insist on playing ball. I, 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 I try really hard to not be, to not reveal my hand politically, so to speak. I like to keep, my, my joke is I like to keep everybody confused. Because I, I walk, I try to walk with Christ. And I'll be honest with you with this, I, I, don't, I don't believe either party is interested in God. I don't. That's my personal thought. But I do know this, that especially like in a community like this one here, that is a predominantly conservative community. That the tendency is make sure you speak this way because if you don't, people will leave. That's a reality. That every single pastor in this community is very well aware of. And many will embrace it. Say, well, it's okay. I believe that way anyway. Let's do it. And when we refuse to do that, we'll see what, what has happened. We'll see people attack you because, well, you need to be one side or the other. And if you believe in that, then you hate that. We are going to be attacked if we follow the course that God has for us. Sister Janet's right. The Lord is going to do something amazing. He's doing a work. I see it coming. But it's not, it's not like what's been done. And it is in a manner that I think a lot of people are going to be scared of and they're going to push back from. And it's going to make a lot of people feel like, well, I'm no longer, I'm no longer being focused upon. And, and that's when you've been focused upon your whole life. It's hard to believe that someone not focusing on you actually still likes you. There are 41,000 people in this community. We need to reach them all. So instead, our love for God, our love for others should compel us, as John has written, to be faithful until death, and then he will give us this crown of life. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And I want to leave you with an encouraging word. Amen. I see this group here, and I see how so many of you, many of you have been um, muddling through this um, Chaos, I think that's a good word with me for the last three and a half years. And I know that, I know I'm a lot. And, and I apologize. But I see your hearts and I know you. I know your heart and I know that yours is to do with the will of God. And so I want to encourage you that if you would ride this out, if you would do this with the Lord... We will engage in a true worship. We will embrace the spirit of the gospel message of God. And this community will be better off because Mercy Springs is here doing what God has called us to do.
So let us be faithful and worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Amen? Amen. Let's rise to our feet. Father, I pray that you would just guide us today. We want to praise you, to love you. So Holy Spirit, light us on fire. Bring your spirit from heaven. Fill us. Make this place not only hallowed ground to you, Father, but fill it so much that your spirit consumes everything outside, that it overflows into this world. There is nowhere that anybody can hide without feeling your grace. In the darkest parts of this world, bring your light. And let this entire world, this generation, every generation that stands here today, let us rise up and praise Him. And realize that all this that you're doing, all this, all this wonderful, glorious thing, it's this amazing King. And we pray this in His name, our King, Jesus.